All right, the portion of 3 John I want to focus in on starts there in verse number 4. The Bible reads, I have no greater joy than to hear that my children walk in truth. Beloved, thou doest faithfully whatsoever thou doest to the brethren and to strangers, which have borne witness of thy charity before the church, whom if thou bring forward on their journey after godly sword, thou shalt do well. No greater joy. The, the title of my sermon is No Greater Joy. Joy and what a joy it is. The, the, the joy that he's describing. This is something that we all ought to strive to want to have and, and take this epistle of John and receive this and, and understand you can have a great joy. He says, I have no greater joy than to hear, to hear this report that my children walk in truth. What a good feeling is. What, what an accomplishment. Now he's talking about children here, and we're going to get into this a little bit. This is kind of going to be the, the the, the meat of the sermon, but John's referring to spiritual children. He's referring to people that he has led to Christ. And he's, he's referring to someone he's, that he's hearing a good report. This is someone that he led to Christ, he helped disciple, he helped to train up, and now he's hearing, even though he's not there, he's hearing just this great report. The whole church is reporting, wow, yeah, this guy's doing a good work. He's a really godly man. And he was... And that's bringing, he says, I don't have any greater joy than just to hear that my children walk in truth. And I'm breaking up my sermon at two points tonight, is there's, you know, you could apply this. I believe we could apply this, even though he's speaking primarily, he's talking about physical or spiritual children. We also need to apply this physically to physical children as well. I read this verse and, and I can only imagine the great joy that, that I hope to have one day when my children are adults, when my children are off on their own, and I could just hear a report from other people, not from themselves, but just from other people that know them, that, hey, they're walking in the truth. They've stuck with it. They've endured. They're, they're doing a great work for God. They're living righteous lives. They're doing a great work. What joy that's going to bring to my heart. What a sense of accomplishment of being able to do something and say, Yes, thank God I succeeded and helped to raise these children to get to a point to where other people can look at them and say, they're walking in truth. They're walking upright. They're, they're doing what's right. And that is a, a very important thing. And, you know, uh, this morning we had, of course, the baptism of Abigail, my daughter. And it means a lot to me as a dad, just that my my children, when they, when they decide, when they choose to get saved, you know, obviously I preach them the gospel and try to, try to do a thorough job and make sure they're not just, and it's, it's hard with children. So we're, we're in the physical children aspect. It's, it's hard for children, especially your own children, to make sure that they're understanding the concept and not just telling you what, what you know, you want to hear. Because children, you know, in, in, a, in, a, in a good family, in a loving family, they, they want to please their parents. Generally speaking, the children, they want, to, they want to do what's right. They want to gain you know, acceptance and things like that. So it's very, it could be difficult sometimes to preach the gospel to your own children because you want to make sure it's really sinking in. And it's something that they're actually choosing and not just repeating and not just saying, oh, because dad expects this of me or whatever. Because we all have our own choices. We all have to choose for ourselves what we believe in. And I don't force you know, salvation, and I don't force baptism on any of my children. I try to, you know, bring the content up, make sure they understand everything completely and, and talk to them and have lots of conversations about it, but I don't force that. So what, I, what really brings joy to my heart is when they choose to, you know, receive Christ or when they choose to say, yeah, I want to get baptized now. Because that shows me their willingness, something that they want to do, and that's, and that's some joy. But See, the baptism, that's not the end. This is only the beginning for her and for her life. This is just the start. And one of the things we need to keep in mind about this concept of looking forward to a day where we could have no greater joy than to hear that our children walk in truth is we need to have that vision from an early, an early point, from an early age, from a young age. I need to keep this vision of my children walking in truth when they're adults 
in order to help me to mold them while they're young and to stay focused on the things that really mattered and make sure that if I want to be able to have this great joy, then I need to invest the time now. It's not going to come on its own. It's not just going to happen on its own. It's going to require a lot of work and a lot of effort on my part if I want to have that type of a result. I guarantee you that John invested time in this person and didn't just leave him to go off in the wind and say, oh, well, great, yeah, he's, he's doing good. It's something that someone he cared about and, and invested in in order to see that great result. Turn, if you would, to Deuteronomy chapter 6. Deuteronomy chapter 6, because the Bible teaches us that we have an obligation, we have a duty to be very diligent about raising our children right, raising our children to fear the Lord, raising our children to have morals and standards that line up with God's word. This doesn't happen on its own, and, I, and I'll tell you what, it's not going to happen in school. And even just sending your children to church or to Sunday school or something like that, that's not good enough either. God has delivered the responsibility of raising children to the parents. That is who God holds responsible at the end of the day. It's mom and dad. It's your job. God has blessed you with an incredible blessing of having a child to begin with. But with that great blessing comes a great responsibility. Deuteronomy chapter 6, we're going to see how, what the Bible teaches about, about how we ought to teach our children. Look at verse number 6 of Deuteronomy chapter number 6. The Bible reads, And these words which I command thee this day shall be in thine heart. Now, just a, you know, when you look at it in context and you read Deuteronomy in context, he's basically talking about the words of the law, the words that he's teaching them, these, the, the, the commandments of the Lord. The, these words which I command thee this day shall be in thine heart, and thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children. That word diligently is important. It's in there because you need to be, make it a very uh, high priority. You need to take it seriously. It's not something that just happens in passing. You need to take it on a, a, upon yourself to make sure that, that truths are being taught, that God's law is being taught at home to your children. It's a diligent effort. It's not something that happens by accident. You know, I make my children, they have to read one chapter of the Bible every day. They're, they're newer readers, and, and it's just, it's a standard that I have in my house. It's going to increase as they get a little bit older, but for right now, they have to read a chapter. I don't assume that they're just going to understand everything that they read and just, well, that's good enough because they're reading the Bible. That's not good enough. As their parent, regardless of being a pastor of a church, being a pastor makes no difference whatsoever to me being a parent or to you being a parent. We need to be able to raise our children diligently and teach them diligently from God's word. Verse 7, And thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children and shalt talk of them when thou sittest in thine house and when thou walkest by the way and when thou liest down and when thou risest up and thou shalt bind them for a sign upon thine hand and they shall be as frontlets between thine eyes and thou shalt write them upon the posts of thy house and on thy gates. We start to see the importance of God's word and he's basically saying, hey, when you go to bed, when you wake up, when you're walking down the street, when you're, you know, when you're sitting down to eat, no matter what you're doing, it's always an appropriate time to be diligent about teaching. He's like, you know, they need to be in front of your eyes all the time, write it on your hands, have it on the doorpost of your house, everywhere. Now, if you aren't being diligent for yourself to know the commandments of God, there's no way you're going to be diligent about teaching them to your children. We need to start with making sure that, that we know God's word and that we are being diligent and making sure we're keeping up with knowing what God's word says because you can't teach something that you don't know. Right? That only makes sense. There's no way you could be a teacher of something unless you know how to do it. I couldn't teach you how to you know, go plumb your house or something. I'm not a plumber. I don't know how to do it. I've never done it before. So before I could ever teach anyone, I need to look it up for myself. I need to study. I need to research. I practice it. It's the same thing with God's word. We have children. We, you need to be in this, and especially the fathers. The fathers are supposed to be the spiritual head of the household. And, you know, I know that, that mothers have a tendency to spend a lot more time teaching and, and training the kids, 
But at the end of the day, the, the father needs to be the head of the household and make sure that he knows his Bible very well. And, you know, mom needs to know Bible too. Don't get me wrong. I mean, both need to. But at the end of the day, with the, with the level of authority that God has given and the structure that God has provided, you know, the buck stops somewhere. And at home, it stops with the dad. He's the one ultimately that's the end responsible person for, for his children being raised properly. So um, we need to make sure that we're teaching our children, teaching them truth, teaching them God's word, teaching them these morals, not just morals of like ethics that the world comes up with or Greek philosophers, but what God's word says. Turn, if you would, to the book of Proverbs. Turn, if you would, to Proverbs, Proverbs 23. Proverbs provides a lot of wisdom and instruction, and especially when it comes to rearing children. There is more in the book of Proverbs on how to raise a child than anywhere else in the Bible. The Bible says in Proverbs 22, 6, train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. What a great promise from the word of God. Train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. If we are spending the time and investing and being diligent in training, think about training. Training is not just, you know, it's work. It involves work. If you, if you were to go train for a triathlon or train for some physical event, well, that training process, there's going to be a lot of sweat. It's going to involve a lot of work if you're going to be successful at all in what you're training for. Similarly, when we train up a child, it's, it's more than just teaching. It's, it's discipline. It's correction. And when I say discipline, I'm not just talking about, you know, like a physical spanking or something. I'm talking about discipline of being kind of on top of what your kids are doing and making sure that they're being trained and, and you're being consistent with everything, that they understand right and wrong based on, on you know, things being consistent. It's not like one day, oh, I can't do this, and the next day it's just fine. You know, being consistent and being diligent about how you raise them and teach them right from wrong. That all goes into training up a child in the way you should go. And it's not just about punishing the, the bad things, but teaching on the good things. Not just you can't do this. Those are all important, the, the do nots, but also the do's. What should I be focused on? What should they be doing? What should they be spending their time on? And, um, you know, training a child. But we get this great promise that if we invest the time and if we're tra training up a child, when they're old, they're not going to depart from it. It's going to stay with them. And, and that, is, that is great news because sometimes, you know, you have days as a parent, you could feel like you're failing. You feel like, like everything is going crazy and it's, and it's hard to invest the time because you're being pulled in 20 different directions. But we can take comfort in this fact that we know that if we're training up a child in the way you should go, that uh, when they're old, they will not depart from it. Proverbs 17, 21 says, He that begetteth a fool doeth it to his sorrow, and the father of a fool hath no joy. When you leave a child to themselves and they just end up doing foolish things and, and making a lot of foolish decisions and become a fool, you're not going to have joy. Um, very simple concept there, but when they're doing what's right, it's going to bring great joy. Proverbs 23, we're going to get a little bit, some, some examples of this wisdom and how we ought to be training our children and the things that we ought to be teaching them about. Obviously, there's a lot of things to teach them about, but Proverbs 23 provides pretty good example here of what we're talking about. Look at verse number 15. The Bible says, my son. So it's directed to, you know, the narrator's son, my son. If thine heart be wise, my heart shall rejoice, even mine. So again, we see this, this promise of joy and rejoicing from our children being wise, being a good person, having good morals, having their head on straight, walking in truth is going to bring a great joy to us. If thine heart be wise, my heart shall rejoice, even mine. Yea, my reins shall rejoice when thy lips speak right things. What a blessing. You know, I'm blessed just when, when my children are able to go out in public and say please and thank you and be well-mannered without me saying, hey, what do you say? What do you, you know? And, and, but that's part of the training, right? You, you train your kids. You have to, to reinforce that over and over again, and that requires diligence. Now, I know, you know, having basic manners may seem a little bit, it's not silly, but it, 
it, it's a real simple example. Obviously, there's things that are even more important than that, but we need to be diligent in all aspects. We want our children to be, to be polite people, to be, um, you know, not just rude and ignorant and, and you know, wicked people, but, but people who are going to learn the right ways, and you need to be diligent about that. But when they're able to do things on their own, and they've learned, and you can see, hey, this is actually sticking. It's actually going somewhere. What a great feeling that it is. That is a, um, a great joy. Verse number 17. So this is the instruction. Now, he starts off by saying, hey, I'm going to be really happy when you have a wise heart, when you're doing things that are right, when, you're, when your lips speak right things. And now he's going to give the warnings and the heeds of, of what you need to watch out for. Girls, pay attention. The Bible says in verse 17, Let not thine heart envy sinners, but be thou in the fear of the Lord all the day long. This is a common pitfall, especially for children, especially for people who are a little bit younger, when they look at some wicked people in the world, some sinners, the sinners that, you know, the, the, the movie stars or the rock stars or these people that get lifted up in the public eye. People who get lifted up, but they're living these really wicked lifestyles that we're teaching our children. You, you're not to be like this. This is not the way God wants you to be. You need to have more. But they see that, and then because they know that they're not supposed to do that, they become envious over what they have. And the outward appearance, and you know, Satan's really good about doing this with sin, of making it seem like it's this really fun thing to do, and it's going to be really attractive on the outside. And wow, look at these movie stars and rock stars, and they have all this money, and they live in these mansions, and they go to parties, and it's all fun, 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 fun. But you don't see the end result of that. See, he shows you the, 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 the fake, the facade, the fake image in front to make it all look so great. There's a reason why these people don't stay married, that they go through multiple marriages and divorce. There's a reason why they're on drugs and alcohol so much. It's because they don't have joy. They're trying to fill a void, and, and, it, and they're, they're failing at it. Because they're not going the right way. Because they're trying to use the lusts of the flesh to, to satisfy an emptiness. But when you feed the lusts of the flesh, it's just going to keep on growing bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. And this is the truth. And this is what you need to understand. We can't be envying, and children especially, don't be envy. Don't let your heart envy sinners and, and want what they have. Because it's not that good. What you need to have is a proper fear of the Lord all the day long. Keep with the truths of the Bible. When God says something is wicked or wrong, and you see someone else doing those things, don't be envious of those. Remember who God is. Fear the Lord. Verse number 18. This is why you shouldn't be envious. For surely there is an end. Because there is an end result to their wickedness. And it's not good. It says, And thine expectation shall not be cut off. Hear thou, my son, and be wise, and guide thine heart in the way. Be not among wine-bibbers, among riotous eaters of flesh. For the drunkard and the glutton shall come to poverty, and drowsiness shall clothe a man with rags. So don't be envious of the drunkard. And the glutton that's just doing just anything that feels good to the flesh, they're just consuming. Yeah, it looks like they're having a good time, but the Bible says, you know what, they're going to come to poverty. And, and you see it all the time. Go down to Phoenix especially. Go downtown Phoenix. You'll see a lot of the, of the, you know, the homeless population in Phoenix walking around. And I'm not saying 100%, but the vast majority of them are drunks and drug users. It's just a fact. You know, people don't want to admit that fact anymore. These days, but it's a fact. That's why they got, get themselves in that position. And, you know, I've witnessed to, to I don't know how many people are homeless. You're running them on the street, try to get them saved. You know, try to give them the gospel. Every once in a while, you run into someone who is saved. But, um, you know, you try to give them the gospel. And, and unfortunately... You know, because I, I try to talk to them. I'm not going to give them money to feed their habit. It's not going to happen because that doesn't do them any good at all. But what I do try to do is do something that will help them, and that's give them the truth and tell them the truth and give them the gospel. But unfortunately, so many of these people, they just, 
They just love their, their alcohol, their drugs so much that it's not like they want to be poor. It's not like they want to be homeless, but they, they still choose that over getting rid of the drugs. Now, they weren't always in that condition. At one point, they had a house. They had a career. They probably had a family. And that's the point where you got to make sure, hey, you're not envious of them. No one's envying the, the drunk in the gutter. That's not envious of anyone. But we need to realize and look at that truth and say, hey, that's the end of these people who look like they're having all this fun right now. That's where they end up. That's why you shouldn't even give any consideration to what they're doing um, as being a good idea or maybe something that you want to try and be a part of. Be not among wine bibbers, among riotous ears of flesh. Jump down to verse number 22. Hearken unto thy father that begat thee, and despise not thy mother when she is old. And this is something that, that I wish more children would do is give more credence to their parents, especially as they become a little bit older and start to think that they know everything. Look, I've been there. I think we've all been there. We understand what it's like to feel like you know so much more than mom and dad. But you don't. You don't. Mom and dad want nothing more than for you to just seriously listen and consider the truths that they've, they've learned either through experience or just from God's word and be able to, to listen to those things and apply that and, and keep that. There are so many things, and I'm sure everyone here would agree, man, I wish I knew that when I was younger. Man, I wish I didn't make that mistake because that really cost me. And there's, I know I can say that in, in, in more ways than one. I wish I really had a better understanding of how destructive certain behaviors can be because they are. And, you know, it's one thing to hear about these things in school. You know, we had, when I was going to school in the, in the 80s, it was DARE. Yeah. Remember the DARE program and, you know, things like that with drugs and alcohol. And you hear that stuff, but usually it just goes in one ear and out the other. When you hear from God's word, though, it ought to carry more weight. It really should. It ought to carry even more weight. And that's why it's important as parents to teach your children about God, who God is, what his attributes are. Yes, he's loving and long-suffering and merciful, and we love him for that, and, and you know, it's, it's tremendous. But God also is a God of judgment and justice, and, and you know, he's the one that we go to to right every wrong. And he's also one that, that you know, he's the judge. He's supreme, and, and he doesn't, God's not mocked. The Bible says, be not deceived, God is not mocked. For whatsoever man soweth, that shall he also reap. So our, our actions will bring consequences. And even though God loves us, and he doesn't necessarily want to see us suffer, we end up reaping the results of what we do. And children need to understand that. And parents need to teach that to their children. And it starts with even some of the simplest of rules that from a very young age, they need to start learning that there's consequences for their actions. When, when children are never disciplined and never punished, that's where they turn into these kids that, that throw fits in the grocery store and just, you know, screaming, punching their parents and doing everything else. That's a result of no discipline. Children need the discipline. They need to be taught early that there's consequences for their actions because... That's truth. That's reality. There is consequences for their actions. And if you as a parent just always want to shield them from any consequences, guess what? They're going to grow up and then one day you won't be able to shield them anymore and they're going to end up in prison facing consequences for their actions because you didn't want to correct them when they were younger. That's a cold, hard truth. Let's keep reading here. In verse number 23, the Bible says, Buy the truth and sell it not. Also wisdom and instruction and understanding the father of the righteous shall greatly rejoice, and he that begetteth a wise child shall have joy of him. Thy father and thy mother shall be glad, and she that bear thee shall rejoice. My son, give me thine heart, and let thine eyes observe my ways. 
That is a very, another very important point to stress here, that when you are training up your children, the best way to be able to teach them is not just from your mouth, but from your ways, by being an example unto them. Because children will pick up way more. If they think, if they think you're a hypocrite and, they're, and you're saying, do what I say, not as I do, and you're just trying to teach, even if you're teaching them the right things, but you're just guilty of all this stuff that you're trying to teach them, they are going to have no respect for what you're saying. Because they're going to think, if it's really that important, Dad, then why don't you do it? Why are you telling me not to do this, but you're doing the same exact thing? That's going to go a lot farther with them than just telling them something, even if what you're saying is right. To be a great teacher, to make sure that your children are going to follow and, and be taught and trained in the right way, you need, it starts with you being that example so that you can say, hey, look at me, observe my ways. Do you see what dad's doing? Do you see what mom's doing? We're your examples. Follow what we're doing and you'll do well. Give me thine heart. That's a serious, you know, talk about a heart-to-heart -heart conversation with your children. We ought to be having those. And fathers, you know, I know, you know, being a man, you, you, you could be tough, and sometimes you're seen as insensitive, but your children are that important. You need to be able to have heart-to-hearts with your children. You care about them, you love them. You know, there, there comes a time you need to be able to sit down and, and allow, you know, Talk to your children and gain that trust from them to where they will be willing to give you their heart. And that trust is going to come from them knowing that you care about them, you love them, you spend time with them, you talk to them, as well as disciplining them when they do wrong. And, you know, it, it, it's actually counterintuitive, but I, I, I've seen this over and over and over and over and over and over again in my own household. Unfortunately, especially with the split homes and stuff, parents are afraid to discipline their children because they think it's going to make their child hate them. They do. I see it happen. And you, you get these, uh, and, and you know, divorce just ruins so many lives and so many you know, families and marriages. But um, obviously it ruins marriages. But um, the kids grow up then oftentimes in, in an environment where now mom and dad are competing because they're divorced, because they're on different teams. They're not together. They're not unified in raising the children. So now it's who can give the child more to win over, to buy their affection. And that is disastrous because that is not what the child needs at all. It's a really screwed up perception of reality. And, and parents that do that are really messing up their children and they probably don't even realize what they're doing for a selfish motivation of just wanting to buy affection. Children need parents. And one thing that, that children will do, when you can discipline them properly, they will respect you and they will love you for it. And that's what I was saying, it seems counterintuitive, but I've given my children spankings before and then right afterwards, I mean, they're cuddling up and being real extra nice and cozy and I think a lot of that has to do with they know that you care about them. And, you know, when they know they do wrong, they know they do wrong. And when you're willing to just say, no, this is the rules and you broke them and you need to be punished for it, that's what's right. They understand that. And deep down inside, they appreciate that more. You don't have to worry about pushing your children away by disciplining them. It's going to make them even closer to you. It does good. You, just, you have to have faith. And we have to have faith in, in God's word that teaches that. I'm not going to get into all the verses tonight. You could read in Proverbs 23, actually. Um, I'm reading off my notes. But Proverbs 23 has a, um, verse number 13 says, Withhold not correction from the child, for if thou beatest him with the rod, he shall not die. Thou shalt beat him with the rod and shalt deliver his soul from hell. Those are strong words. Now, obviously, when it's talking about beating, it's not talking about the way that we think of beating today, of like beating someone up. 
It's not what it's referring to. We have to use some common sense here. But that word beat is still something that's used as inflicting some pain on the child in a, in a way that's not going to injure them, but is going to get the point across that there is a very unpleasant discipline or consequence for their actions. And that is what the Bible teaches, and that's something that, that we need to keep in mind when we're training our children. And that's why he says, you know, hey, you're not going to kill them. At least, I mean, you're not doing it right if you are, that's for sure. But, you know, you beat them with the rod, and when you do that, it says, thou shalt deliver his soul from hell. And the reason why I believe that that verse says that is because, unfortunately, today, when, when children have no punishment, they have, they have a very hard time grasping the concept of there being consequences for their actions at all. And what is the consequence for our sin but hell? Do you know how many people, younger people today, especially the ones that, that don't receive any discipline, they don't even believe hell's real. They just think it's fiction. They just think it's made up. No, hell is real. And they need to understand that there are consequences. And when they start from a young age, get re, you know, having it reinforced that, oh, when I do bad, when I do wrong, when I break mom and dad's rules as a punishment, it's very easy to then go from that to, hey, God is the everlasting father. God is the one who makes rules for all of us. God then has consequences for us breaking his rules. And, and that's why I believe when they, when they get that concept, then they'll be like, oh yeah, I don't want to face that punishment. And it delivers a soul from hell. But back down there in um, verse number 26, my son, give me thine heart and let thine eyes observe my ways. Verse 27, for a whore is a deep ditch and a strange woman is a narrow pit. She also lieth in wait as, a, as for a prey and increaseth the transgressors among men. These are real basic truths that children need to be warned about, about you know, getting involved in, in drinking and drugs and getting involved with fornication and strange women or prostitution or whatever and all this stuff that's all gratifying to the flesh. And especially children as they begin to get older and become teenagers and start to, to mature, they're going to feel the desires more and, and, and want to, to know more about that and want to kind of go in that direction, but they need to be taught the fear of the Lord. And they need to be taught what God says, and, and it needs to be open to them so they could, they could really get the entire consequences for what they're doing and, and not be willing to trade a little bit of fun, what they think is going to be fun, for potentially a, a lifetime of repercussions. Turn, if you would, to Proverbs. Um, well, actually, turn, if you would, to, to Matthew 28. Turn, if you would, to Matthew 20. I'm almost done on the, the physical end. We're going to go to the spiritual end. Proverbs 10, verse 1, reads, A wise son maketh a glad father, but a foolish son is the heaviness of his mother. Again, just going back to the concept of having joy from, from raising a wise son or a wise child. And Proverbs 17, 25 says something similar. A foolish son is a grief to his father and bitterness to her that bear him. That, that, you know, the way that we raise our children to be either wise or fools is, is very, it's, it's tied in completely with our own happiness or grief. You know, you don't invest the time, you don't train your child, they're going to grow up to be a fool and it's only going to cause you grief. But when you invest the time, you spend the time with your child and, and teach them and train them and make them wise, then they're going to be a great blessing. And you're going to be very joyful in seeing your children walking in, in truth. Now, just as it is important to raise your physical children, which it is, it's very important, we must also work to help raise spiritual children. And this is what John was talking about primarily when we, when we started off in 3 John about his children walking in truth. He wasn't talking about physical children. He was talking about someone he led to Christ. The Great Commission, Matthew chapter 28, look at verse number 19. Jesus Christ said, Go ye therefore. So this is his, 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 his great commandment unto his disciples and to those that follow him. And that's, you know, that's who you are. If you follow Christ, if you're a believer, and if you follow Christ, if you want to do the works that Jesus has for you to do, then you're going to listen to this command and participate in this command. As he said, go ye therefore, 
He says, go out, not bring them in. He says, go out, therefore, and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Amen. Now, we typically think of the Great Commission as, as going out and preaching the gospel to every creature, which is something that, that is a part of the Great Commission. It's something we ought to do, and that's something we're striving to do here in this church. But it doesn't just stop with preaching the gospel. If we really want to fulfill our mission, it's going to be more than just preaching the gospel. We want to get them baptized, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost. And not just that, we also want to teach them. Teach them to observe all things whatsoever I've commanded. They're all important. Obviously, getting saved is the first and primary thing. That's the most important. But then next, getting them baptized and teaching and training and discipling them and helping them to grow to be able to go out and produce fruit on their own. I mean, it's, it makes perfect sense. How, how much work is going to be done for the Lord if you never train anyone else to do the job that you're doing for God, like of being able to, to witness to them, you know, preach the gospel, if you never teach anyone else how to do that, it's only going to be you. Only one person can only accomplish so much. You can only reach so many people. But if you have people that you invest time in, and that's why it's important to be able to invest time in people other than just yourself. Look, it's important for you to read your Bible and to pray and do all these different things. But instead of saying investing you know, 20 hours a week reading your Bible, which, you know, I know it's a really large number. You say, instead of doing that, if you can cut that back, but spend some of that time now training someone else, it'll be worth how, whatever you think you're losing by not studying so much. Whatever you think is, is, is going to be lost. You gain so much more when you put those efforts into other people because if you could make them kind of like you, you know, you're leading by example. You're being that spiritual father and say, hey, follow me and do as I do. And you spend time to teach and to train those spiritual children. Well, now you've just multiplied. Now you've just said, hey, the works that I'm doing, someone else can do. And then you teach someone else and, and, and you have more and more people. That's how it grows. And that's how a great work is really going to be done. It's not by ignoring everyone else and just saying, well, I'm just going to study and do everything myself. It's, it's being able to teach and to train others as well. Turn, if you would, to 1 Corinthians chapter 4. 1 Corinthians chapter number 4. Starting in verse number 10, the Bible reads, We are fools for Christ's sake. But ye are wise in Christ. We are weak, but ye are strong. Ye are honorable, but we are despised. Even unto this present hour, we both hunger and thirst and are naked and are buffeted and have no certain dwelling place and labor, working with our own hands. Being reviled, we bless. Being persecuted, we suffer it. Being defamed, we entreat. We are made as the filth of the world and are the offscouring of all things unto this day. Now, what he's describing is their dedication and their work and their love for the people that they're serving and ministering to. They're saying, hey, you guys are honored. We're despised. You guys have everything great. We're the ones that are going through the hard times, uh, the hard work. We're going to lay out ourselves. We're going to pour out our own souls for you. And that's the example that they're giving is being selfless to help other people. I mean, think about it. it there's, there's so many correlations between raising children. You think about how selfless you, you should be towards raising your own children, right? You, wanna, you want the best for them. That's why you work real hard. That's why you do all these different things. You, you want your children to succeed and you're focused on them. And, and there's so many things that, that you do in your life that you give up of your own because you want your children to to succeed. You might, you know, pass up on, on some of the little simple pleasures that you might want to have for yourself because, hey, I can't afford that because I want to make sure that my kids have, you know, enough education or enough, you know, whatever, whatever it is that's important. 
to provide for them. You, you, you sacrifice of your own to give unto them. It's the same concept being done for spiritual children as well. Verse number 14 here, he says, I write not these things to shame you, but as my beloved sons, I warn you. Now, I'm just going to take a, a, just a side note, sidetrack on this. There are people out there that will criticize the terminology that we use. Like, we go soul winning. And they'll say, well, you don't win anyone to Christ. Well, according to Scripture, according to biblical language, we do. Now, I'm not saying that I am the one that has the power of myself to save a soul. Nobody that believes like us believes that. We know that Jesus Christ gets the honor and the glory and is the one who actually died and bled and rose again and provides the power to save the soul. We, we definitely get that. But what we also see is this concept of God using the human instruments, the ministers of God, to go out and teach other people and to lead them and to point them to Christ and that that is actually a very important job and something that ought to be done. So when you say, hey, I got somebody saved today, that's actually completely biblical to save that. The Apostle Paul said, you know, I've become all things to all men that I might by all means save some. Does that mean he's not giving credit and glory to Jesus? No, but is he saying that he saved people? Yes, he is. It's biblical terminology. We're not trying to lift up ourselves, but we need to go out and, and, and do the work and do the labor that Jesus has given for us to do. And when we say things like, oh, we got this person saved or that person saved, we know that the power of that salvation comes from God. But if, if I'm the one that leads them to it, there's nothing wrong with me saying that, you know, I got this person saved. It's like, when you, th you know, someone, I've heard this illustration before, someone's drowning and there's a big branch or there's, there's a flotation device or something that's out there already and they don't see it and you go, hey, you know, turn around and grab on to that life jacket or grab on to that, to that inner tube. You saved that person because they didn't know it was there. You pointed it to them. Now you could say, no, you didn't save them. The, the lifeboat saved them. Okay, but I pointed him to it. So that, that, you know, Jesus is the Savior. He's the one that, do, that really does the saving, but we're pointing people to Jesus. So in a sense, we get people saved, but obviously Jesus Christ is the Savior. Does that make sense? And we see this language throughout Scripture. And the reason why I bring it up is here, because he's even saying, we know that when we're born again, we're born of God, right? We're born of the Word of God. We become children of God. But he, the Apostle Paul is referring to people as his beloved sons. The Apostle Paul wasn't married, by the way. He didn't have physical children. He's referring to spiritual children, people that he led to Christ as people that he has begotten through the gospel because they got saved as a result of him preaching the gospel to them. So just, just pay attention as you read the Bible. You'll see this come up multiple times. Um, but that's not the main point. Let's get through this. He says, I write not these things to shame you, but as my beloved sons, I warn you, for though ye have 10,000 instructors in Christ, yet have ye not many fathers. So now he's referring to himself as a father. He says there's a lot of instructors, a lot of teachers. There's a lot of pastors, there's a lot of churches you go to. There's a lot of people you can learn from. But you don't have many fathers. One person led you to Christ. He says, for in Christ Jesus, I have begotten you through the gospel. He's still giving Jesus Christ credit. But he's referring to himself as being, you know, I've begotten you. I labored. I traveled. I worked. I showed you God's word. I explained it to you. I pointed you to Christ. When you received him, it's like I was beginning you, being a, being a father to you. That's, this is what the scripture says. I'm not making this up. I'm just reading it. And, and it's, it's very simple to understand. And that's why... There's this, what he's emphasizing here also is that, hey, 
I know there's a lot of teachers out there, but I'm the one that led you to Christ. And, you know, I wish more people would have this understanding of people that we lead to Christ. There's people that we lead to Christ, but then they just go off somewhere else and they go to some church that's not teaching the gospel. That's not, do, like, like, doing this work and they just go off somewhere else. It's like, hey, why would you go back to this church? You've been, you know, some people go to church for decades. They never hear the gospel. No one loves them enough to approach them with the truth. No one sits down and explains how easy it is to be saved and what Christ did for them. No one does that. Someone, random person they don't even know, shows up at their door, shows them the good news, shows them the gospel, points them to Christ, becomes their spiritual father in that regard, and then they just go off somewhere else. It happens. But that's why, you know, the Apostle Paul is saying, hey, you don't have many fathers for in Christ Jesus. I have begotten you through the gospel, verse 16. Wherefore, I beseech you, be ye followers of me. I'm the one that brought you the good news. These other teachers didn't. Hey, be a follower of me. He's taking on the responsibility of being a father to these spiritual children. <laughs> and no, I'm not a Mormon. I... I, I when I said that spiritual, you know, if you know the Mormons, they, they think they're going to be gods of their own planets and make all these spirit babies and stuff. It's not what we're talking about here. So, sorry. Oh, hopefully I'm not confusing you in that, in that aspect. You probably don't even know what I'm talking about, and hopefully not. But um, he's taking on the responsibility of being a father, a spiritual father in the sense. He said, hey, be a follower of me. Look at the work that I'm doing. Follow what I'm doing. I brought you this good news. I brought you this truth continue on with me here. And this is the attitude that we need to have when we go out and preach the gospel to people and say, hey, you know, and, and I think we could be a little bit more bold with this too. I think this might be an area where we're lacking in general as a church when we go out and preach the gospel to people is not just leaving, but, but saying, hey, you know, the church that you're going to, if people are already going to church, have they explained this to you? Did they show this to you? There, there might be an issue. And just point it out. I mean, you know, we, we want to use tact. We don't want to, to come off as just being real arrogant or sounding like jerks or anything. But, you know, if, if the work's not being done, is that really the place that you want to be and keep going to? And they, they, didn't, they weren't even able to show you that? The most basic thing in the whole Bible about being saved? Verse 17, For this cause have I sent unto you Timotheus, who is my beloved son. And again, he just keeps referring to people as being his son and him being a father. Who is my beloved son and faithful in the Lord, who shall bring you into remembrance of my ways, which be in Christ, as I teach everywhere in every church. Just as it is important for a parent to not only teach the right thing, but to lead by example in, in the physical sense, it's the same way with the spiritual children. We need to be leading in a spiritual sense. So when you lead someone to Christ, you know, and you're saying, hey, you should come to church and everything else. Well, what happens when you're not there? It's not a very good example that you're leading by. Hey, church is important. You should be here all the time. You should come in. You should learn. You should grow. But I'm not there. What, what example would it be if, if, if I wasn't here? You know, I go out and knock on a door, and especially being the pastor, it's like, oh, yeah, pastor's not here. He's just gone again. Come to church. Oh, yeah, you, you go to church. No, it's, it's not a good example. Leviticus 19, verse 17 says, Thou shalt not hate thy brother in thine heart. Thou shalt in any wise rebuke thy neighbor and not suffer sin upon him. We need to be more concerned for the people that we lead to Christ as well as other people within the church. That, that verse I just quoted is, you know, it's, it's, it's a caring for people even if something that you have to say may not be received well. When you're suffering not sin upon someone, you're noticing something in their life that needs correction. You see, hey, they're doing something wrong. But when you love them, you're going to point it out to them. And again, we need to show tact. We need to be, to be humble and not come across as this holier than thou and I'm going to tell you everything that's wrong in your life, you know, a type of that. No one's going to receive that well. But if you could humbly entreat your brother or sister in Christ in an area where it's pretty obvious, you can see there's an issue here. There's a problem. I love that person, so I'm going to try to help by pointing it out to them. Oftentimes, especially if someone has their heart right with God, but they're caught in, in, in an area 
they know they're wrong. Usually they know they're wrong already anyways, but just somebody coming up and saying something about it and mentioning it or bringing it up might be enough to, for them to just be like, yeah, you know what, you're right. I need to just, just quit that, whatever it may be. You have to have the right approach, but if you love them, you're going to tell them about it. I use a, a, another silly example, but I use this example. I'm trying to explain this concept. You know, if I was walking around with like, um, I'll use a real life example. One of my children leaves like this big mess on my suit or something, right? And I'm going to be going out and speaking to people and talking to people or getting up in front of everyone. And it'd be kind of embarrassing to have this big old, you know, mucus, whatever on my jacket from one of my children. If you care about me, you're going to let me know about that, right? You might be like, and I know it's a real silly example, but you say like, hey, Pastor Berzins, look, you've got this thing over here. You might want to take care of that before you, you know, stand up in, in, in front of everybody. Oh, well, I, if I'm a preacher, I'll be like, hey, thank. instead of being like, oh, why are you judging me, huh? What's wrong with that? These people shouldn't care if I've got some kind of stain on my suit. You know, no, you don't have that. You don't have to have that type of an attitude towards it. You know, someone humbly entreats you. We ought to be uh, gracious and understand that they're saying that out of love. And the Bible's teaching us that we shouldn't suffer sin upon our, our brother, our neighbor. You know, we, we, we ought to care about them enough. Just like we care about the lost enough to go preaching the gospel, we don't want them going to hell. Right? We're trying to warn them. And it may be unpleasant for them. They might not want to hear. I mean, the last door that I knocked today, you know, the people were being pretty interesting. <laughs> Use a really, a really nice term. But I kept, you know, trying to plead with them. And they, they said, oh, heaven is what you make it here and hell, everything's here. I said, no, hell's a real place where people are going to be tortured. Tor you know, that's not a fun thing to talk about, but it's true. It's a truth. And, and they need to hear that. She said, well, that sounds scary. I go, yeah, I know. It is scary. That's why I'm here. That's the reason why I'm standing at your door today. Because if it wasn't real or it didn't exist... No big deal. Fine, do whatever you want. But it is real. And we need to warn them. And, you know, and some people, oh, I don't want to talk about religion. You know what? It, it's worth it to, to be a little uncomfortable to provide that warning and to provide that truth. And that shows that you care about that person and you love them. And the same way that you apply that to, you know, to, a, to a lost soul, we ought to be able to apply that to each other and look out for each other you know, and, and not have a condescending attitude, but have, have a, you know, a, a humble attitude where, where we do care about each other and looking out for the, for the best. I mean, but my children, if they care about each other, when, when one of them sees the other one doing something they know they're going to get disciplined for, they ought to care about them enough to say, hey, you know, you probably shouldn't do that because if dad sees you doing that, <laughs> it's not going to be good for you. And, 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 you know, and trying to help them out in, in, that, in that regard. And that's the reason why we would help out a brother or sister in Christ because we have a heavenly father. And the Bible says that the Lord chastens every son whom he receiveth, that he will discipline us. And if we can see an area that, that you know, people are just getting involved in sin, you want to stop that and say, hey, <laughs> you ought to try to take care of this because if you let it go on too long, it's going to, you know, God's going to be pretty mad. So anyways, I don't want to be a dead horse with that, with that point. Last place I'll be turned, turn to Colossians chapter 3. We're almost done. Colossians chapter 3. We started off in 3 John. What a great blessing it must have been for John to hear about one of his converts where he said, you know, no greater joy have I than hear that my children walk in truth. But then a little bit further down, it gives us a little bit more insight as to what he was hearing, the report that he heard. And in verse 6 it says, which have borne witness, talking about the church, has borne witness of thy charity before the church. So this guy, this convert, was, was, was charitable. He had charity in his heart. Whom if thou bring forward on the journey that after a godly sword, thou should do well. And this has not happened by accident. Yes, you need a willing person that wants to serve the Lord because that, you know, the convert, they need to have a willing attitude. Now, you can't force anybody to serve God, right? For, in order for a situation like this to happen, 
the person who's the convert, they need to be willing to learn and to grow and to do something. You, you cannot force it otherwise. So without that, you know, it's up to them. But when you have that willing person, you also need people to help guide them and instruct them and encourage them along the way. That is also necessary. So we, we need both. You need the willing heart of the one person and the, and the willing willingness to, to invest and to work from other people to help encourage and instruct them. The Bible says in 1 Timothy 1.5, now the end of the commandment is charity out of a pure heart and of a good conscience and of faith unfeigned. The end of the commandment, the end result of the commandment says is charity out of a pure heart. You're in Colossians 3, look at verse number 14. And above all these things put on charity, which is the bond of perfectness. Having charity in your heart is, is, is kind of like arriving in your spiritual growth as a Christian. Now, we never arrive, but he's talking about here, above everything else, put on charity, which is the bond of perfectness. And here, in case you, you know, I know we're using the King James Bible. Some of the language isn't all um, used in our common vernacular, but the word charity there, people have a tendency to think charity is just like giving money to someone, but that's not what it's all about. Read 1 Corinthians 13. It tells you all about charity and what it means. But basically, an easy way to, to remember what charity means in the Bible is just think of the word care. It's, it's a similar root word for, for charity or caring. Caring, having this love for other people. It's where you're esteeming someone better than yourself, where you're humble and you care about other people more than you care about yourself. That type of a selfless attitude, the selfless attitude that Christ had to lay down his life for us, that is charity at its finest. That is a, a, a love for everyone else at your own expense. And when someone can grow to that point, to just be full of charity where they have knowledge, they have wisdom, and they really care about helping other, where it's all about everyone else and not you? Well, that's what Jesus was about. Jesus didn't come to be served and to have servants. He came to serve. He came to give us the example. He washed his disciples' feet. He healed the sick. He went out. He didn't have a home. He didn't have a place to lay his head. He went out and stayed up all night praying, working all day, all for the benefit of other people. To the point to where he, he allowed himself to be shamed and spit on and beat up and nailed to a cross. All for other people, for you and me. That's the end result. That's where we want to be. And to hear about someone that you were able to lead to Christ, growing to the point to where they have great charity and everyone around them is being like, yeah, this guy's, you know, he's doing good. He's doing right. What great joy that is. Now, to see a convert come to that point is truly joyous, but that's not something that happens overnight. That growth takes a while to cultivate and to, and to grow. I mean, it just, just is with children. It takes years for them to grow into good adults, to good people who have wisdom, that, that know how to, to, to be a good person. Same way spiritually. People need to grow. And we need to have grace with people. You know, someone just gets saved. They, pro they could have all kinds of problems in their life. But we want to see them grow. We want to encourage people to grow and to come closer. Now, because that's something that doesn't happen overnight, in order to experience that joy like John had, you need to make sure that you don't slip out of church yourself. You need to take heed to yourself. You could be winning people to Christ today, and maybe they do through, through other people or through yourself. You know, they, they start growing and growing, but when you fall out of church and they keep going, you're not going to experience that joy because you, you fainted instead of, instead of continuing on the path. So just remember, we take heed to ourselves. Excuse me. Let's strive. Let's have the vision and the faith in other people and being able to bring them 
to Christ and be able to raise them just as much as we raise our own children, we raise the, the spiritual you know, converts, our spiritual children, and, and invest time in them, and, and it's worth it to help them to grow and for you to have that charity where you care about them. You have to, you'll have to sacrifice your own time. You'll have to sacrifice things that maybe you want to do in order for that to work. But it's worth it. Other people are worth it. And that's, that's why we're here. Let's bow our heads have a word of prayer. Dear Lord, we thank you so much for loving us so much, especially when we didn't even deserve it, that you loved us that much. It would have been really easy for you to turn your back on us because we all have made our own beds. And we, you know, you could have just said, well, you made your bed and I'll sleep in it. And, you know, you, you've, you've broken my laws. You've broken my commandments. Too bad for you. But you, you didn't have that attitude with us, dear Lord. You loved us even despite all of that enough to pay for all of our sins, Lord. And we thank you for that. And it's very humbling. I pray that you would please work in our hearts and our souls to try to, to, to strive to become more like Jesus, more like your son, and help us to be able to lead other people to you and to be a good influence, a good impact in their life, and just to, to share the truth with them, the truth with them, dear Lord, and um, not that we wouldn't censor your word, but we truly love them. We're just gonna just give the whole counsel of God. You know, some people might be offended by your words, but, you know, we're going to give them the truth no, ma no matter what. And it, it's, um, it's not our job to censor your words. Let's pray that you would strengthen us, give us boldness, help us all to grow. We, we all need to grow spiritually. None of us have arrived. We, we all have uh, this, this flesh that we have to deal with on a daily basis, Lord. And I pray that you please help us to get the victory over that. And Lord, really just help us to improve on our follow-through and discipleship of, of new converts. And Lord, help us to, to revive that, that burden in our heart that wants to, to see other people grow and, and to help them to do a great work for you as well. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.